Dear most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I ask for an outpouring of your Holy Spirit. I ask for your angels to surround me and cover me. And I ask for you to speak through my lips this morning because I'm a sinner and I need you and we all need you and I pray that you will prepare our hearts to receive a blessing not from me but from you in Jesus name I do pray amen have you ever used the expression I'm only human it may be Thank you. You may have used it when you may be um, walking down the road or something and you trip and fall, or you just trip and stumble, and everyone's looking at you and to kind of save face, you go, I'm only human. Or uh, you may be talking with someone and they relate a story where they told someone off or um, you know, said some things that weren't right, and when you gave them a strange look, um, they respond by saying, I'm only human. Um, Sister Rhonda, a couple of weeks ago, shared a story with, about one of her coworkers just ranting on about something at the office, and I can't remember if Rhonda responded in words or just in action, but the lady just responded, I can't help myself. You know, um, a few weeks ago, the Lord gave me an experience with this as, and it was funny because I was actually in the office with my notes in the office, um, just trying to come up with what situation I wanted to share. And the Lord brought it to me right then and there. In our office, unknown to me, a couple had come into the office, a more mature couple. And my and she came up to the chiropractic assistants, which I refer to as CA. That's what we call our assistants in the office, chiropractic assistants. And the lady was very rude um, because they hadn't been in the office a long, in a while, although they were established patients, um, they had to fill out paperwork. So the wife was just complaining about why do I have to fill out this paperwork again? Then, as she filled out the paperwork and she made a mistake, she said, to, came to the CA, you need to give me some more paperwork, as if the CA messed up. Um, and so when the CA went to help her and show her what she needed her to fill out, she said, don't write on me. Um, so she was quite rude, but the CA was gracious and replied back in each situation in a nice way. But what made matters a little kind of bad for the CA. In the massage chair, where only the CA can see, was a gentleman who saw everything and was kind of chuckling to himself, and the CA um, recognized this. So the way our office is set up, basically I stay in the back. I don't know what's going on in the lobby. And I just move, there's sliding doors in between the rooms and the patients are brought in through um, regular doors. So I never have to, for the most part, come out into the lobby. And so I see my, I'm in the back just seeing patients and getting them out of the office. I even saw this young man who had been chuckling and he didn't say anything to me. Although normally if something goes on like that, somebody would say something to me, but they didn't. And so instead of going back to my study, because our office has become so busy that the little computer that we have doesn't work well in getting the information back to me so that I could uh, put in the information on the patients that I see. So until I get my big computer, I have to come out to the front office. So after I cleared out the office um, in the back, I went up to the front so I don't get far behind. And as soon as I sit down to the computer, here comes my CA around the corner and she is just, doc, 
whatever you do, get this patient out of here. She is just so rude. I've just had it up to here. And she was just going on and on. And I'm kind of laughing at her just because of her expression and everything. But she said, she, and she explains everything that I just told you about what's going on. And so then the phone rings. And I said something to her, but she starts to gain her composure. And she starts to head back to the front desk. In the meantime, my other CA turns and says, Bless her heart. <laughs> and that's the term we sometimes use when we make excuses for other people. But I want you to take time and think about what actually are we saying when we use these terms? I'm only human. I can't help myself. Bless his or her heart. What are we really saying? If we're truly, truly honest with ourselves, we are making excuses for our wrongs. Basically, we are making excuses for the sins in our lives. So I asked the question, am I only human? Is that all I amount to? Let's go to the Bible. I want you to turn with me to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. And I'm going to begin reading verse 4, and I'm going to skip around, so just follow me. I'll let you know where I am. Verse 4 says, And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. Now let's skip down to verse 10. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called the heath seas. And God saw that it was good. Now let's go to verse 12. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good. Now we're going to skip over to verse 18, referring to the sun, moon, and the stars, and to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness, and God saw that it was good. Now, verse 25. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. What's the common factor in there? God saw that everything was good. All right, now, continuing on with verse 25. And God made, I'm sorry, I skipped, oh, no, I said 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Now we're going to go to the end of that chapter, the verse 31. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So, God created everything. It was good. But after he created man, what did he say? It was very good. All right. Now, Let's turn a page, or it may even be on that page, to chapter 3, where we read where we did sin. In verses 1 through 8, it explains, in, in summary, how this Satan, Eve wandered from her husband, the serpent spoke to her, she, she took the fruit, and then she ate it, and then she took the fruit and gave to Adam, which she was forbidden not to eat. But... Let's go to chapter 3, verse 12. What happened after they had sinned? And God came along and asked them what had happened. 
Verse 12, it says, And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Adam blamed the woman, and he also blamed God, the woman who God created. Eve blamed the serpent who tricked her, but in essence, she was also blaming God who created the serpent. So what are they saying? They were making again excuses for their sins. They were saying, I'm only human. I can't help myself. And to answer that question, am I only human? I would say yes. Because of sin, we did become only human. But God had a plan in place just in case this would ever happen. So we would not have to remain in this only human state. And they touched on it this morning in Sabbath school. God immediately gives a promise of his plan to save us. That is the plan of salvation. And it's immediately following um, in verses 13, 14 through 19. Go home and read that. Part of the plan um, that God put in place happened immediately. And when I use the word immediately, I'm referring to during the lifetime of Adam. And it caused much pain. A major part of the plan took place later. Let's turn to Matthew chapter, 20, Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. And it says, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. God sent his son to save us, not in our sins, but from our sins, which should cause us even greater pain because of how he had to do it. But yet it should cause joy and love to reside in our hearts as we think about what God did for us. Because God's desire is to bring us back into face-to-face -face relationship, the face-to-face -face relationship we had with him when he first created us. Christ came to this earth and, and put on humanity, lived and died that we may experience salvation. How can this happen? Psalm 77, 13 says what? Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? So this plan, this plan of salvation, can you see this? No, it's not. It's not gonna work in this light. It's too light in here. All right. The plan of salvation is represented here in the sanctuary. Many years ago, Christ left heaven and came down to the court of the sanctuary, which is the earth. Christ came and lived, in the, per lived the perfect life despite the disadvantages, the ridicule, and the suffering that he experienced in his life here on earth. This is represented by the gate. As you look here, and I know it's a distance from you, um, the gate is made of many beautiful colors. Um, and if you go into Exodus uh, chapter 25 and you read that section there, it'll tell you the colors. The colors are blue, and if you look in Numbers 15, 37 through 41, where it talks about how the robes had fringes of blue to remind us of the law, Christ was obedient to the law to the very end. The second color is purple. If you look at John 19, 2 through 3, it talks about how they not only put a crown of thorns on his head, the Roman soldiers, but they also covered him in a purple robe, 
which means Jesus, and it stands for Jesus and his kingship. Also, the next color in there is scarlet. Hebrews 9, 29 tells us that blood had to be shed in order for us to receive salvation. That is, represents Christ's service and his sacrifice. And the fine twin, twin linen, which is white, in 1 Peter 1, 19, talks about the lamb without spot or blemish, which represents Christ's spotless character and his righteousness. As the gate was the only way to the court of the sanctuary, Christ is the only way to the Father, which is the only way to heaven and is the only way to eternal life. Let's turn to John 14. John chapter 14. And I'm going to begin reading here at verse 5. It says, Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Amen. Not only did Jesus give us the perfect example to follow in living our lives here on earth, but he also showed us the Father. Turn also a few chapters over to verse 17. Chapter 17, I'm sorry. And I'm going to read verses 25 and 26. It says, O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. Amen. And Desire of Ages, page 19, says that he, being Jesus, came to reveal the light of God's love. And he glorified the Father by crediting God with his source of power. If you turn to Matthew, back to Matthew chapter 15, And I will be reading verse 31. It says, Insomuch that the multitude wondered when they saw the dumb to speak, the maimed to behold, the lame to walk, and the blind to see, and they glorified who? The God, the God of Israel. Now, The ultimate love was shown at the cross. Romans 5.8 says, But God commanded his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This is represented at the altar of sacrifice. Right here is the altar. and You can see the cross there that represents the altar there. Where Christ, where Christ, where Christ sacrificed his life for each and every person who is listening to my voice in this room. He took on your sins as well as my sins and died to death that we deserve. So when I use the term that I am a Christian and repent of my sins, and by the way, the Holy Spirit, the same spirit that moved upon the earth, is moving upon our hearts all the way through this. Um, I am saying, when I say I'm a Christian, I'm saying that I accept Christ and him crucified for my sins. And he will forgive me of my sins. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But not only am I forgiven of my sins, I am cleansed from all unrighteousness. This takes place at the labor 
and the foot. Let's go to Romans 6. Romans chapter 6. And I am going to pick up at verse 3. Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. The labor and its foot represents baptism spoken of in Romans and also represents the ordinance of foot washing, which provides continual cleansing. When I go down in the watery grave, I'm dying spiritually to self. And when I come up, I am a new creature in Christ. I am thus justified by the power of Christ. Can I call myself a Christian and say, I'm only human? What does that say about my faith in Christ? Amen. Now, a little side note about death. Dead people cannot feel. If I go up to a dead person and I yell at that dead person, he is not going to yell back at me. If I punch that dead person <laughs> or I shake that person vividly, that person is not going to retaliate. So, Testimonies, volume 2, page 425 says this. Those who are dead will not feel so readily and will not be prepared to resist everything which may irritate. So if I am dead and my life is hid in Christ, Colossians 3.3, 3, I won't get upset when others treat me wrong. Does that make sense? Do you follow me? As I focus on what Christ has done and is doing for me, because I am dead to the carnal man, throughout this process, the love for my Savior grows and takes control of me. 2 Corinthians 5.14 says, For the love of Christ constraineth us. I read in another uh, version, the love of Christ controls us. Then I am moved to sacrifice all on the altar of sacrifice. That means, all means everything, not only my sins and my bad habits, but also anything that separates me from Christ. It also means dedicating my life totally, totally to him, including my time and my talents for his service and his service alone. Isn't that what Jesus was talking about in Matthew 16, 24? Let's turn that quickly for me. Matthew chapter 16. And we're looking at verse 24. And it reads, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And verse 25, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Thus, I am ready to allow the Holy Spirit now to move me into the process of sanctification which takes place in the holy place. That's this compart first compartment in the building part of the sanctuary. The place in heaven that Christ went to when he left this earth, which is the courtyard. This is where spiritual growth 
continues with Bible study, table of show, which is the table of showbread, prayer, the altar of incense, and witnessing, the candlestick. Remember the life that Christ lived while here on earth, which was represented in the colors on the gates, and also the entrance to the holy place is also the entrance to the most holy place. We must allow the Holy Spirit to perfect in us Christ's character as well. Ephesians 4.15 says, But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Now, going back to my CA, one might say that she was justified in feeling as she did. After all, the patient was very rude to her. Uh, and, and did not speak very nice to her. You might even say that she was even doing very good by holding back her tongue and not letting, letting her have it. But let's turn to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. And I'm going to read verses 2 and 3. I'm sorry, James chapter 1. That makes more sense. James chapter 1 says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Now, when I told you the story about the CA, and I told you just before she regained her composure and went to the front, I told her something. I told her, maybe the Lord is trying to teach you something. She says, oh yeah, what? I said, patience. She gave me the look and went on about her business. Um, but uh, after, you know, then, after that, I finished my work at the desk, and I went on back to see the patient. Now, a lot of times, and it's, this is not the first patient this has happened to, but this is a new CA. We have two new CAs, and so they're learning the office work, so they haven't had much experience with these patients. But a lot of times, when patients come in and they're cranky like that, when they come back to us, we have no idea how they acted up at front. They are the nicest people you want to see, you know. Then I come out later on in the day and they say, so-and-so was so great. It's like, oh, she was pretty nice when I was there. But this patient, when I came back, she was cranky. There's no doubt. Um, and so, you know, I probed by asking questions and, and this is what I found out. This patient, first of all, she was walking on a cane and she really needed to be in a wheelchair. Uh, or off, at least off her foot because she had actually broken her foot. And so for several weeks, she could not get into the office and she had a very bad headache. And so as she was talking to me, she realized that the headache was affecting her attitude. And she actually apologized to me. And so um, knowing that, I went ahead and I took care of her and she went on out into the lobby then I proceeded to take care of her husband. So um, whenever I got a chance to go back out, I asked my CA, so how was the patient when she came out? She said, oh, she was a totally different person. And so I shared with her the reason of her attitude, not that it was right, but she was in a lot of pain. And a pain will cause you to do some crazy stuff. And so, um, so we have to keep that in mind when a lot of times when patients come into our office, they are in a lot of pain. And so, um, just like um, us, if we are, are carnally led, we have a heart of stone, just represented by the cold heart and the lukewarm heart. Um, we will want to retaliate and we will, even, even if we're given the chance, we will retaliate. But when we are spiritually led, we're no longer led by the flesh, 
by, by the Holy Spirit, we will be on fire for the Lord and the love we have for him will spill over and we will show love for our fellow man and try to lift them up and encourage them whether they are nice to us or not. You'll see the, sorry, the branch, I mean the vine representing Christ, the branches representing us will produce the fruit, the fruits of the spirit. Philippians 4.13 says, which was our scripture that was read today, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Now my CA, I do believe she had got it at least for this time. <laughs> Two days later, I overheard my CA relating the story to another CA that wasn't in the office that day. But she went on to say when she went home that evening, she has a, uh, he's about a uh, 12 month old son that was very fussy and, and just upset. And she said when she went home and she got him, was taking care of him, she remembered what I had said earlier that day. The Lord is trying to teach you something, patience. So she said, I did not allow him to get me upset. I just dealt with him and it took 45 minutes. But once I got him calmed down, I had peace the rest of the night. And I said, praise the Lord. I said, well, brothers and, si brothers and sisters, isn't that what Christ wants for each of us? Love, joy, and peace. Some of the fruits of the Spirit found in Galatians 5.22. If we never allow the Holy Spirit to convict our hearts of our sins and make excuses because I'm only human or I can't help myself, we will be stuck outside of that gate with a cold heart right there. Or we may have repented of our sins and been baptized, but we keep repeating the justification process over and over again, and we feel we are in need of nothing. We just keep doing the same sins over and over again and not allowing the Lord to help us to overcome the lukewarm heart. When Christ returns and the books are closed in that third compartment of the tabernacle, it is time for glorification. And if we're still in those states, either the cold heart or the lukewarm heart, when Christ comes to this earth to take us home, we're still going to be on this earth. And we will be eternally lost because we did not allow Christ to take control. Christ is coming back for those who follow him, the lamb, whithersoever he goeth. We see that in Revelation chapter 14, that these are the 144,000. And if you remember, back on this poster, I talked about the um, gate that represented Christ. But well, we have white linen curtains all around. One of the things that is said that that represents, we're told that that represents is the 144,000 clothed in Christ's righteousness. And I, I've heard people say they don't have to be a part of the 104,000. They will be sat simply satisfied just being a part of the great multitude, which no man can number, spoken of in Revelation 7, 9. But as I think about it, this multitude, if they had lived, they would be a part of that 144,000 because they live lives controlled by the love of Christ. Like the 144,000, we must die daily or we will not be a part of the multitude. Testimonies, volume 7, page 44 says this. Each morning, consecrate yourselves and your children to God for that day. Amen. Make no calculation for months or years. These are not yours. One brief day is given you as if it were your last on earth. Work doing its hours for the master. Lay all your plans before God to be carried out or given up, as his providence shall indicate. Accept his plans instead of your own, even though their acceptance requires the abandonment of cherished projects. Thus, the life will be molded more and more 
after the divine example. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ. Philippians 4, 7. As I'm coming to a close, the love of Christ is the key. I ask you, do you love him? He came to this earth to bring us into a courtship relationship with him. He offers his love freely. He died for us and is risen and intercedes for us when, even when we do sin. So, the, the sermon I told you about that I was inspired, he actually went into marriage. And I'm just going to touch on that marriage relationship, but it's not with here on earth, but it's with Christ himself. Christ came, and he's given his all for us. He is proposing to us. He is courting us in the courtyard. And if we accept his proposal, the Holy Spirit will move us into the sanctification process where Christ is trying to clothe us in his righteousness to prepare us for the marriage. We can't go in with our own robe and our own clothes. We cannot. We have to allow Christ to fully cover us with his robe. And then when he returns, he is coming for his bride when the work is finished in the most holy place, to take us to meet face to face again his Father in that holy place. Do you love the Lord? Will you bow your heads and meditate on what Christ has done for you? Please close your eyes and meditate on what Christ has done for you. He has promised that he will never leave you nor forsake you. You just simply have to give him your heart, your whole heart, not a part of it, not just 95%. He needs 100% of your heart. Do you love him? Do you love me is the question he asks. Now, the next time my CA is faced with a can cantankerous patient, my prayer is that she will remember the peace she had when dealing with her son and will not only talk nice to the patient because it is a rule of the office, but she will treat her nicely out of a heart of love because the patient also needs to experience the love of Christ as well. And Christ wants to use us to share that love with others. As you think about what he has done for you, the great price he has done, you could probably think of many others you could share that message with. Christ desires us to share that love with others. Like Christ asked Peter, do you love me? He said, yes, feed my lambs. We may even mess up like Peter, but Christ says, my grace is sufficient and he will forgive, forgive us when we repent. No more excuses. As was said in Sabbath school, when our hearts are, when our lives are hid in Christ, we're not just human. We can't use the excuse, I can't help myself. God says, I am all the strength that you need to do the work that I ask you to do. Do you love him? If so, will you consecrate your life to him today? God is page saying earlier is there for us every time. We let him down, he never lets us down. If you're willing to reconsecrate your life today, Please come forward.
there's just one other thing I have to ask. If you have never given your heart to the Lord before, now is the time. The Lord is knocking at your heart's door even now. Do you love me? I'm doing everything I can for you. I just need you to accept me because I will accept you as you are. If you have never given your heart to the Lord before, you've never been baptized into his church, come and join us at the front. If it is your desire to be a part of this family, as was spoken of last week, the Lord wants to save families. And this church is a family. And he desires to save everyone in this room. So if it's your desire, please raise your hand. If you have never been baptized before and you desire to come to him in baptism. The Holy Spirit is moving upon this place. I'm asking Pastor Norm if he will offer prayer of consecrate, reconsecration at this time. Shall we bow our heads in prayer? Father in heaven, Lord, you see us here. You know our hearts. You know our desires. And you recognize our weaknesses. And we are all too well aware of our weaknesses, Father. We want strength. You've offered us strength. This day, Father, we give ourselves to you. We recommit ourselves to you so that you can do the work in us that we cannot do. And we joyfully accept this, thanking you, praising you, knowing that by faith this will be accomplished. We ask and pray these things, believing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.